Hello everyone. We, the members of Astro Club of Ferguson College, welcome you all to the virtual talk. We have organized it under the Department of Physics of Ferguson College. I welcome Dr. Ashish Shankar to introduce our speaker for the day. Oh, thank you, Surbi. Good afternoon to all. I hope that you are all safe and sound at your home. I am Ashish here. I welcome our eminent speaker for today's virtual talk, Dr. Suhin Mehti. I welcome you all participants on behalf of head of the department and principal Deccan Education Society Ferguson College Pune as you are all aware that the present year our physics department is celebrating the golden jubilee of post graduate section so it is a pleasure to invite our post graduate alumnus dr tuhin for this virtual talk here i am just giving you the brief introduction of dr tuhin as you are aware tuhin has was awarded with a msc physics degree in to, june 2009 from ferguson college pune then uh, for his msc project work he worked with the scientist dr pankaj kodar at national chemical laboratory pune in 2011 he had joined in the national institute of the university of cork ireland for his phd program and then further received his phd degree in physics in year 2015 From year 2015 to 16, he was a postdoctoral fellow, and then from 2016 to 18, an Irish research council post on such as low power non-volatile memory and energy harvesting. His current research deliver his virtual talk. Thank you so much to him. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asis, uh, for giving me the interactions, and thank you, the uh, club, for organizing this uh, virtual talk. Uh, I think everyone is doing well at their own place. uh so i'm going to talk about uh, my recent research uh, what i have done in uh, my stay in cambridge in last two years uh so i have summarized that uh, under the title of a new tool in the toolbox uh, vertically aligned nano composite for functional retuning so recently uh, most of the uh, research is concentrated on uh, power so power like a electrical power is going to be a, a major concern in uh, next decade or so due to lot of portable electronics we are using in our day to day life so recently on an average we are using 2.5 electronic devices like mobile phone a smart watch or tablets like that which is going to be increased in uh, next few years uh, in ten years it will be like 3.5 times uh, per uh, person apart from that we used lot of data so while taking pictures in facebook and uploading it and using youtube or something like that we use lot of data and these data are stored in the data center and the data center consume a huge amount of electricity or power other than that like space uh, research or space uh, program also consume lot of uh, energy and then uh, healthcare like our hospitals also consume lot of uh, electricity as well as uh, the data security uh, process so the power is going to be one of the big challenge for future electronic devices and uh, which uh, i am trying to address in my research uh, so far and in future just to give you an example that how much uh, the power consumption is going to be for instance uh, the data center now it consumes around 1000 tera watt uh, in 2018 which is going to be three times like 3000 tera watt by 2030 which is like a three times more than what we are using today and this amount is like a more than a power consumption of a lot of countries uh, in in the world so for that uh, i don't know whether you know or, or uh, not so the data centers are situated either in under the sea or in the north pole so that they require less power to cool down due to the cold weather uh, the main reason is that there is a lack of new materials which could address this problem so that's why new functionalities in the material is required uh, so people are using lot system to address or to uh, build or make the electronic devices but somehow the oxide materials are kind of uh, ignored though they have a lot of properties for example there is a way uh, to manipulate the spin orbital and charge at the same material 
Oxides can also be different kinds, like for example, superconductor, magnetic, ferroelectric, and they can also be controlled by electrical coupling, fastison, and strain. But due to the lack of functionality at room temperature, oxide materials does not seem to be a main focus of the industry for fabrication of electronic devices. So my aim so far was to concentrate on these oxide, the functional oxide materials and try to manipulate their properties so that these materials can be used for next generation electronics. Major focus was on uh, functional ferroic materials. So I'll talk about this. So what is a ferroic materials? The so ferroic materials are ferroelectric or ferromagnetic and then magnetic electric materials. So they can be uh, charge manipulation may be there or speed manipulation can be there. And if in a single material, both the charge manipulation, that the electrical manipulation, and then magnetic manipulation, that is spin manipulation, coexist, then this material is called multiferroic. So multiferroic research has been going on for more than a decade now. Uh, there are so many which are purely multiferroics at low temperature or uh, partially multiferroic uh, also. But there is a lack of room temperature multifericity. There is no such single phase material uh, now has been invented which has really good both magnetic properties and ferroelectric properties so i'm giving a one example in this functional oxide material i'll talk about uh, these uh, research today so there's different way to manipulate or change their properties change their geometry so by in any way if we can change the structure of these materials then also we can manipulate their functional properties or we can change the charge ordering so instead of having a you know, um, sequential charge we can distort it and can have also uh, is out of that or there is a different kind of spin driven mechanism because it holds uh, the atoms of these multiple materials holds a different kind of spins and their own interaction as well as to change their um, electronic generation, so P and D orbital, that's the outer orbital of the uh, atoms, can also be influenced by different way, and that's how we can also change their properties of this kind of material. So that's why the material has gained a lot of interest, but unfortunately at the room temperature, uh, are not useful due to the lack of uh, good uh, properties which can be used for the device making people are trying to do for instance inserting uh, external atoms into a crystal structure for instance if we take a purely ferroelectric material and implant some magnetic uh, atoms inside it then we can possibly make the magnetic and ferroelectric and get, can get a room temperature multiphericity or we can use a um, uh, bilayer system and in at the interface due to them of atoms we can have a room temperature multiphericity or stacking multi uh, layers altogether also can be used as a uh, artificial multiferric. So one layer will work as a magnetic layer, another will work as a electric layer. So these are called artificial multiferric. And due to the recent advancement in instrumentation, so there is a possible to use external influence like pressure, light, etc., to change their properties and um, manipulate uh, depending on the requirement of the devices. So I am trying to uh, work on this area. So the recent research suggests that by uh, pr using pressure, we can change from a one type to another type. For example, if we change a pressure from four gigapascal to six gigapascal, then a one ferroelectric material can become um, antiferromagnetic ferroelectric. Or if we increase the temperature, also they can be become paraelectric. So this is the phase diagram of this kind of material, which has both temperature and pressure. Uh, recent report uh, published in Nature Communications by uh, in Japanese group, who has shown that in TV, you know, MNO term, multiferric material, by using high pressure, like 8.7 gigapascal, we can change the spontaneous electrical polarization so that it can become multiferric but they are at a low temperature. And another problem of uh, pressure uh, is that uh, we can probably in a lab, we can create a huge amount of pressure, but in a device, how can we create or how can we give uh, that huge amount of pressure? Because the devices are too small and there is no external uh, additional device to create that kind of pressure. 
So there is another research parallelly was going on. Instead of having an external pressure, we can use the strain of a substrate uh, to create a pressure on the material. So let's discuss how. So this is the two atoms, surface atom of the substrate. And the distance between these two atoms are AS. Then if we want to deposit epitaxially on another crystal, which has a distance between two atoms are AF, and if that does not match as the distance of substrate, which is quite thick, can create a strain on the deposited material. But remember, epitaxially deposited. So there are two kind of uh, strain can be uh, created. One is called compressive. So compressive means the distance between the materials or the what the material we want to deposit. That larger than the distance of the substrate atom, then it's called compressive because the substrate atom try to match its own lattice parameter deposited material. And if it is the other way, then it's called um, thin side. Luckily, if you see that these are the substrate's lattice parameter and these are the material's lattice parameter, so there's a number of substrate available which has a similar or uh, lattice parameter of the material we want to deposit. So if we choose one substrate, for example, STO, and we can choose this B, uh, bismuth uh, titanium oxide, then we can create an, one kind of strain, or we can choose the BIMNO3, which also can create another kind of strain. So by depositing epitaxial material on to different substrate, we can also create a different kind of strain or pressure in, in the material. But that also has a limitation because if we continuing deposition, so after certain um, thickness of the material, the substrate strain does not affect much because the material itself try to relate the materials deposited close. But as we increase the thickness, then the substrate effect does not play a role. Another problem is that it only in plane pressure we can or the strain can create by the substrate, so we cannot. Yeah, by this method. So then we, uh, so this is one exa another example of sumarium manganese oxide that by using this epitaxial strain, we can make them ferroelectric or paraelectric, or we can change their you know magnetic and electrical properties. So that's the phase change is possible by using this kind of strain. Then due to the problem of uh, two problem mainly that um, the substrate strain only happen if it is very thin. It does not happen. It's very thick sample. Another is only in plane. There is a no out of plane component of the substrate strain. So we come up with a, another solution, which we call as a vertically aligned nanocomposite. So in the material, we also deposit the materials epitaxially, but instead of depositing only single material, we can deposit two different material at the same time. So one material form a matrix, which is let's say green color here. And within that green matrix, we have a column structure of a secondary material. Um, to uh, choose the material very carefully so that they do not mix each other, while we then otherwise we will not get the column, nice looking column uh, within the matrix. So this is a very easy and uh, and we, we have optimized that, that what is the parameter we need to create such a well-refined structure. So my group in Cambridge was 10 years, and the last two, three years, we have started uh, getting very nice result uh, out of this kind of structure in different materials. So I will discuss. So in Cambridge, we uh, use pulse laser depositions uh, to prepare the sample. So if someone is not aware of a pulse, I will just briefly explain. So there is a high energy laser, so this box, and it can create a very uh, high energy laser pulse, which is like 500 millijoule. And this is the vacuum chamber, and there is a one target and the substrate is there. And the substrate is heated at a very high temperature of 600 degrees Celsius to 800 degrees Celsius, so that uh, when the atoms are deposited on the substrate, the atoms get enough energy to form a crystal, which we want to make. So this is the schematic diagram of the pulse laser deposition. So this is the substrate holder. So it, we heat it according to the temperature we need, or 800 degrees Celsius. And the laser is coming here. 
and this is the mixture we want to deposit so we make a target out of uh, some um, chemical composite dry powder or something and make a, a pellet out of it and as a bigger let is constant then it's try to compress the materials it is depositing so it's called compressive strain and if it has a higher uh, let is constant than the material we want to deposit it have a thin cell strain now between the matrix and the column there also needs to be crystal match now if they also have a, a difference of lattice parameter then also we can create a tensile and compressive lattice strain depending on the lattice match between these two different materials so by that we can create a different kind of strain and due to the different kind of strain so this is in plane strain like in a and b direction and this is out of plane that is c direction so by this vertically aligned nanostructure we can create three dimensional strain on the column matrix column or the matrix and these materials has to also needs to be um, the young modulus has to be close uh, enough to create pressure to each other so that is another critical point we need to consider but i'm not going to talk about that because it will make more complex so as you can see by changing the strain we can and the temperature deposition temperature change the uh, functional uh, properties of these materials so we'll go to the one example here here so as you can see there's a different uh, multiferric materials are there uh, where lattice parameter are very close to the substrate lattice parameter different of uh, them are conductor insulator or metallic so by just changing a little bit of strain we can change their uh, material properties like we can make a insulator uh, metallic we can make one metallic uh, material a uh, insulator also so this is a kind of a phase diagram so if we change a normal single phase film without any column only the strain is near the substrate and rest of the film does not have a substrate so big uh, control over their functionality but if we create a vertically aligned nano composite then we can change so there is different research was going on to make this kind of vertically aligned nano composite but by correctly choosing the substrate and the material compositions we can rightfully choose the amount of strain and create the right amount of pressure so this is kind of uh, other material uh, which you can use so Uh, the composition we have to consider so if we are using this is aboc structure so if we are choosing that as a column then we have to take a matrix or non symmetric structure to make a matrix so this is another uh, parameter we also need to consider so let's summarize it consider first we need to consider the lattice parameter of the substrate as well as the material we want to deposit they has to be close to each other then we need to choose the matrix material and column material so both of their structure cannot be similar otherwise they will start mixing together and then we will not get a matrix and the column so this is main two parameter we need to consider so by this technique we can create different kind of fans so this is like a kind of multi dots fan instead of only a single column we can create one small column and then deposit one material and create again the fan structure like that we can create the so 2d material also so if we combine these two then we can create a zigzag kind of thing so these are the top view of this fan uh, structure it can be circular or it can be also you know a uh, square kind of shape now one may ask that how can we control the dimension like the diameter of this uh, column so to do that we can change the growth temperature is a one way to do that so by changing the growth temperature we can change the column size uh, as you can see this is one ybco and bhzo3 structure so by changing the different temperature we can change the uh, pillar pillar diameter another way to use the oxygen pressure also or we can use the uh, laser pulse so by increasing laser pulse we can get a much smaller uh, dimension filter So recently, these are the few publications uh, we have done. Uh, so I will um, briefly discuss uh, them. Mainly, we'll focus on the paper in published in Nature. So we choose two materials. One is uh, sumerian manganese oxide, which is our main target material, which is uh, multiferrous at low temperature. But at low temperature, uh, they, it is anti-ferromagnet and para-electric. 
So now the purpose is to make it room temperature multiplex. And then we choose a matrix, uh, which is Bi SM uh, samarium uh, oxide. So as you can see, the structure is different. So the reason is if we cho choose the similar structure, then they will start mixing each other. And this material does not have any ferromagnetic or ferroelectric property. So this is just a, a, a blank material, but we'll use its lattice constant and elastic constant to create a pressure on somarium manganese oxide. So as you deposit the material, this is the top view, you can see the TM image. So this is somarium manganese oxide pillars, and it is surrounded by bismuth somarium oxide. And as you can see, this is called um, element mapping so as you can see that uh, the red is uh, manganese so red is mixed with green here uh, so it's a uh, it become violet so the manganese is not nowhere here so that is their oil separated so that means by this process we can create a oil separated uh, double phase or double material system and here if we can see this is the um, outer plane or uh, z-axis uh, crystal structure mix matching so this when you grow the upward jetson, so seven unit cell of samarium uh, manganese oxide matches with uh, five this of samarium manganese oxide. So this one is creating in plane pressure like A and B direction, and this is creating out of plane pressure, out of plane stretch in a C direction or Z direction. So then we did the XRD analysis. So the XRD says us so these are the straight lines of the STOP, and these are the peak from the samarium manganese oxide. So basically they are 45 degree angle deposited. So it deposited along the diagonal direction of the STO. So that's why you are getting 45 degree difference between the uh, peak of uh, somarium and oxide and the STO. And this is regular XRD peak. Now we did a uh, detailed XRD is called a reciprocal space map to identify how the crystal structure of the somarium manganese has been changed due to the STO. As we can see, so we deposit a different combination of material. So one is only somarium manganese oxide. So these are only columns. No uh, matrix is there. This one is thin somarium manganese oxide and this one somarium manganese oxide, uh, so thin band material. And this is thick. So as you can see, only somarium manganese oxide does not have any um, out of plane strain. Thinner film also does not show any out of plane strain. But as we increase the thickness then another secondary peak started coming out which is basically due to the additional strain we are getting in the thick film so this is uh, the calculated uh, xrd parameter from different films as you can see in the thin uh, somarium manganese oxide band film that is the matrix uh, the in plane lattice parameter change is not very much so, but if we increase that, it just from 0.9, it becomes 3.6. And out of plane, this parameter from 4.2, it becomes 4.9. So that means that in the thicker film, it's a quite high amount of uh, strain is created. The strain mapping in high resolution TM also. So TM also uh, shows us that as we grow the film in the column only, we get a very high amount of strain at the higher thickness. So this is another mapping. So this is the yellow, yellow part is the uh, signature of highly strained film. We don't get any strain in the matrix or any strain and the near the substrate, but you can get a high th uh, strain at the um, thicker film. So this is like a line noisy, but as you can see, the strain amount is getting increased. So this is the schematic diagram. So this is our thin film like that. So there is no strain, only strain is a little bit by the substrate, but there is no in um, by uh, like out of strain is there increase the thickness so the substrate also start giving compression and the tensile strain also comes into play we confirmed it because uh, there is no difference between the thinner matrix uh, film and the plain, plain film but as we increase the thickness of matrix film uh, then uh, we get a different kind of uh, physical property we measure room temperature a ferroelectric property as you can see this is a p2 hysteresis so paraelectric materials are like a straight line so if we measure by voltage and the phase or the polarization or you get a linear curve but we are getting a hysteresis loop so that means in the at the room temperature now the same material has become ferroelectric which was initially paraelectric 
and this is like we can switch the polarization so we can write and rewrite so this is kind of theoretic polarization so we use a minus uh, 5 voltage first for the whole sample then we become like a dark brown and then we change the polarization of the applied voltage and scan this area so it become again light and then again we uh, apply again minus 5 volt then we switch back again so that means the switching is possible and this is a pulse test uh, which is very is called positive up and positive down test so if we apply a pulse voltage then the polarization is there then you get a remnants also and if you apply the negative pulse voltage it goes in the negative direction and as well as we, when we measure the hysteresis loop ideally it was anti ferromagnetic material so in the anti ferromagnetic material the hysteresis loop is nearly like a s without any loop but now we can see there is a loop here so that means our sample has become ferromagnetic at the low temperature but unfortunately it still paramagnetic at the room temperature so we achieve the room temperature ferromagnetism we are still working on it so that means this material has become room temperature ferroelectric and high temperature ferromagnetic which was before not room temperature ferroelectric and low temperature anti ferromagnetic so no ferromagnetism was there at this temperature now to understand uh, the mechanism we did some uh, density functional theory calculation so we simulate the stuff. as we can see when we uh, use the pressure or strain then the bond angle of manganese oxide and manganese changed change as you can see so this is a uh, thinner film thicker film as you can see in the thinner film it is 143 degree and it's become 147 degree almost 4 degree change in the bond angle and then in the bond lane since it was initially 2.038 and it has become gone down to below 2 so the out of bond length also has been changed this is a small change but in the small one single crystal this will affect hugely because these are the spin driven material so that their whole spin configuration has been modified uh, due to in the bond mno bond angle and mno bond length and that's why so what is happening because they have come closer so this atom and this atom sorry so this atom and this atom has become closer and their interaction between them has been increased and that's why um, the functionality of the room temperature ferroelectricity has been observed apart from that material we also have studied other material like lbmo which is multiferroic and the ceo2 which is matrix so here we have uh, created very fine uh materials like as you can see this is uh, only 5 nanometers of columns i mean even nowadays all these new fabrication technology like electron beam or ion beam it's very difficult to create such a small well separated nano structure so this is one thing we get as you can see and they are well separated um like manganese and cobalt and lanthanum are very very well separated and we also can create other kind of uh, structure so instead of only column where we can also create um like nano dots inside a matrix for like a bowl shape kind of thing so we are also working on that so we call it zero three type or one three type nano composite and also we are doing some uh, see understand uh, how we can uh, rightly fabricate uh, desired materials uh, not only that depends on so other work similar work is going on also in the us so this is uh, aping chain uh, our collaborator in los alamos national laboratory he has created very nice structure like this one you can see that one pan structure like a dot 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 and then he deposited only one of lsmo and then again create another dot 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 so this is basically combining the this nano uh, wire and then multi layer film together and creating this kind of and you can change the dimension of them and you can control the unit cell of the structure also and another collaborator of us in hain wang in parbu university is creating like a tunnel junction kind of thing so if you can see it's a, uh, it can be used the gate gate and then drain and source like that so very uh, it's a 5 nanometer so such a small area we can create a, a electronic devices like um Uh, transistor kind of thing can be created by using this method and the oxide materials 
so certainly I would like to thank our collaborators. So this is uh, my previous mentor in Cambridge and this is my previous group. Um, and then these are my collaborator uh, who helped us uh, to um, do other kind of experiment which was not available in, in Cambridge. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much. And so I have recently joined either Trivandam and we are still taking uh, application for I integrated PhD and PhD program. So who are in the third year of bachelor degree can apply for integrated PhD. So integrated PhD means you can do master degree in ISER and then um, do the PhD. So we don't have to again give another exam to pass the PhD and most likely you will get a stipend while doing the masters. And the PhD, uh, the master student, final year master student can apply uh, or whoever has completed their masters can apply for the PhD program. Not only physics, but you can apply if you're done material science or electrical engineering. So if you are anyone interested, to, you can directly apply there and you can email me uh, if you're interested to apply. So the deadline is 7th June. Thank you. If there are any questions. Okay, so first question by Sunil Kulkarni, what is best application of multi-layer multi Um So let's first think about the multi -ferroics. So multi is the room temperature, ferroelectricity and ferromagnetism. Um, if that's there, then we do not need any multi-layer system. Now, if you want to have something else, like you want to create a um, three arm device, let, let's say instead of just uh, uh, having a, a, a two dimensional device like a transistor, you want to have a 3D stack. So you have a one layer uh, of the transistor and then you want to create another layer, then another layer, then you can see layer of multi -credits. So that is if you have a room temperature multi -credit material. Now, second question is another option comes why we need multi, multi layer multi -credits. Now, because now the room temperature multi ferricity is not easily available. So we can create a multi. So one layer will give us the, let's say the magnetic property and another layer will give us the ferroelectric property and we can have a couple between these two. So that is one reason to create multi layer. So they are called multi, um, artificial multi -ferricity. Another reason to have a multi layer multi is that instead of only uh, ferroelectric property, let's say you want to have an exchange bias coupling system, then you need a multi-layer so that two layer are exchange uh, bias coupled. So these are the few additional advantage you can get from the multi materials and that's the need of multi-layer multi -layer. I think I have answered that. Um, then what are the future aspects or goals? Good questions. So the Vertical aligned nanostructure was um, invented around 2005 2006. So, there are a few groups who are working. One is in Cambridge, one was in um, USA, uh, Ramesh group, um, and probably know, uh, you know, uh, Professor S.B. Ogle. So, he has also published one paper in science in 2006. Uh, in, um, also, some other group in uh, Germany was doing the similar research. But recently, our group has uh, expertised it that how we can use this vertically nanocomposite to create a strain. And not only strain, this structure can also be used for other purpose. For example, battery research. So in the battery research, it's a very uh, relevant now. So the columns can be used as an electrode and the matrix can be used as an uh, electrolyte. Or for example, um, um, fuel cells. So in the fuel cells, you can use as a high surface um, material. So this van structure has a, a huge application. Now, why it was not popular? Because the very uh, defined uh, depositions and uh, good understanding of the this complex structure. So because there are so many parameters are involved, you need to choose the right material combinations. You need to choose the right temperature. 
uh, oxygen pressure also and previously uh, the industry still now i'm not previously still now the industry was not interested to invest any high temperature deposition process but uh, because uh, without high temperature it's very difficult to get a epitaxial layer uh, so now industry had started uh, you know invest uh, in the high temperature fabric methods are coming up uh, so that they can uh, do high temperature large area depositions as well as um, uh, they are trying to uh, decrease the temperature of the fabrication process so that's also we are working that how can we decrease the temperature of the deposition so can the industry uh, become more interested. Uh, then questions by Pranav. What is the advantage of using ferromagnetic material over graphene structure? Okay. So graphene and ferromagnetism is two different kind of research. So the graphene is like 2D material. So that's the interest of the graphene. Okay. So ferromagnetism is a property. So ferromagnet, so graphene is not a property. So graphene is a type of material. Okay, one material I would say, and similar type of materials will be for two D materials. But the ferromagnetic material property. So you can get the ferromagnetism in the graphene also. So I hope I I get your point. So graphene is a material. It can be used for different purpose. It can be used as a ferromagnetic material. It can be used as an electric material. And ferromagnetic is a material's property, not the material. So ferromagnetism can be found in graphene or oxides or any other material. <coughs> okay, next question is uh, Rahman. Can you explain how to choose substrate for good stoichiometry film? Um, yeah, so it depends on what material we want to do and what the material structure it has. So the material we want to deposit, uh, their AB plane, like in plane lattice parameter, has to match with the substrate lattice parameter. So, for example, we use quite a lot of STO because STO lattice parameter is around 3.9, which is very close to most of the multiferroic materials. Now, this 3.9 is not only the uh, next neighbor distance. It can be also if we want to deposit a material of let's say around 5.5 some uh, distance because the one on direction of the STO substrate can be used as the base or a, um, a parameter of the material you want to deposit or this can also be used as a instead of one lattice constant we can multiply by two like a two lattice constant of a STO can match the material you want to deposit and there are a lot of materials. so STO is there then um, LSO is there uh, so there is a lot of if, uh, single crystal and it has to be single crystal uh, so that um, it has a high, highly strained uh, so that uh, it can strain or it can catch the atoms of the material you want to deposit. Okay. So any other questions? Yeah. So next is Adbit. How influence the concentration of oxygen growth of oxide layer and properties of oxide layer due to thermal Oxygen. Yeah, very, very good question. So, advantage of growing oxide is that because it itself is an oxide, so the oxidation doesn't matter because it's getting oxi oxi oxidized itself. But we need oxygen pressure because if it is a low oxygen pressure, then the oxidation will be less. If it is a high oxygen pressure, oxidation will be more. So, depending on the amount of oxygen, the defect will be there. So you need to balance that. So if you do not give any external oxygen, then while the atoms are depositing on the substrate, it may not getting enough oxygen. So the defect will be there. So instead of forming oxide in some places, it will just deposit the other materials. If you put more oxygen, then the oxide state. For example, iron can have a multiple oxygen state. So Fe2O3, it can be Fe3O4, or it can be FeO, depending on the amount of oxide. A uh, lot of time we also, um, while cooling down the material, we uh, cool it in an oxygen. Uh, if there is a, some oxygen vacancies is there, we want to fill that, that up while it's cooling down. So it's called, we call it baking. So the oxygen pressure is very important, but we generally do not bother about oxidation because um, it's a oxide. Um, Sometimes uh, we intensely want to create uh, oxygen vacancy or, or the defects. 
so the defects control defect can also give you a new properties so in this case um, oxygen is important but not um, you know you don't have to be worried about too much unlike a metal deposition okay so next question is sunil kulkarni you mentioned about batteries by using this material any data on the performance oh so um so my group in the previous group in cambridge uh, is called discol group uh, published for the battery application i do not have uh, much knowledge about it uh, so on few couple of good advantage it has is that because now if you have a only two electrodes and you have a in, in the middle you have a electrolyte but instead of you are using like a clamp like like that so you have a more surface area so you all on as your electrode and your matrix as a electrolyte so you get a more if you have a more surface in principle you get a more uh, like a redox reactions there so in this i mean it's not for the this kind of structure it can happen for nanowires also so in using nanowires as a electrode it increase the process but here you can use a solid um, like a, now you have now people are moving to solid uh, solution so you can use the solid um, solution in this band. so that's the other, another advantage but as i say if you want to know more just uh, check uh, the publications of my uh, previous book excuse me <coughs> yeah yeah are you talking about those i mean to say uh, the solid state electrolyte uh, for this kinds of uh, materials yeah. yeah so if you want to choose a solid uh, state electrolyte so let's consider that you want to uh, choose another material which is b now okay. you make a target out of a and b and deposit on the substrate so you get the matrix which is a as a electrolyte b as a column which is uh, as your electrodes okay 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 so fuel cell purposes we can use that yeah fuel cell purposes also similar uh, solid oxide fuel cell so we can you can do that yeah. so that's also our group is uh, working on it with uh, collaboration with other people so what about the techniques uh, in does it does, uh, we always use this pvd cvd pld kind such a kinds of materials or chemical processes uh, can be <clears throat> so pvd and cvd are very good technique you can deposit a large scale materials but then also you do not have a very easy way to epitaxially go the fill uh, so if epitax growing fill fill easy in pld but at the same time it's a high temperature process which is not favored as well as um, you cannot do a large scale sample a lot of industries are trying to solve it now you can deposit in pld like 12 inch wafer also Okay. Using multiple target, uh, but the temperature is still the issue. So people are trying to, um, you know, address that problem. Uh, how can we uh, decrease the deposition temperature? So then, Rekha, there is another question. Can you explain how to choose substrate for? Oh, this is. I think done. I think done. Yeah. Usually, substrate are also heated. Can we deposit film on coal? Okay. Yeah. That's also a very good question. So in PLD, uh, we can deposit film on coal substrate. that's also possible but then the epitaxility will be lost so maybe some area we get a epitaxial film but majority of the area will be non epitaxial so that's another problem uh, with the cold substrate thing but that's uh, true for any other deposition process even in the sputtering also uh, if the cold substance is there very difficult to get a epitaxility good i think there is a one question okay uh, okay fine so there is a one question by dr sunil kulkarni uh, regarding application to gas sensors uh, or mechanical sensors kind of okay so certainly this film also can be used for gas sensor as well as a mechanical sensor now um, both are in a two different way for the gas sensor uh, the column if we we can also etch the uh, one of this material we can etch the matrix then only we can have a free standing columns 
of a very thin um, nanoware kind of thing. I mean, this is the one best way to prepare ultra thin nanoware compared to the conventional electroplating or other way to deposit nanoware. So because you have a very fine nanoware, so that also increases the surface area, which can also be used for the sensing purpose. And uh, mechanical uh, sensor also can be used if they, these materials has a mechanical uh, sensing property. So you can choose any mechanical uh, sensing materials and you can use the similar method because it's such kind of field and you can use the advantage of uh, the particular anion nanocomposite. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Surbi, you can. Uh, okay. Thank you for a wonderful lecture, sir. It was very informative. We would also like to thank you for taking the time to deliver this lecture. I express my gratitude towards the principal Deccan Education Society Ferguson College. We would also like to thank the HOD Physics and all the respected faculty members who provided us with the support and guidance without whom this event wouldn't be possible. To all our viewers, thank you for watching this lecture and also stay tuned for more lectures. And now I will hand it over to Ashish sir. Yeah, thank you to him uh, accepting our invitation during this lockdown period and uh, hopefully it is interesting to our uh, students and hopefully in future some of our students can visit your institute or for some internship or some programs, okay, so we'll yeah. try to do that uh, way also, okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you to him, thank you so thank much. You. Nice thank to you, see everyone. you, nice to see you, okay, yeah. thank you.